It's clear our politics doesn't treat women equally and it's clear from our history that race determines your future. So how do you fix a broken, unequal world where the divide is only getting bigger? Welcome to Q&A. Hey there, welcome to the program. Joining me on the panel tonight, author Bruce Pascoe, who's speaking on climate change at Melbourne's Wheeler Centre this Sunday. Economist at the University of New South Wales, Gigi Foster, is here. Economics editor at The Australian, Adam Crichton. President of Chief Executive Women, Sam Mostyn. Journalist and author, Stan Grant. And joining us shortly from Paris, internationally renowned economist, Thomas Piketty, who's just written a new book, Capital and Ideology. Please make all of them feel welcome. And I should say that if that's not enough for you, Dami Im is here to close the show for us tonight. Hi there, Dami. Uh, and as always, you can stream us live on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. Our first question tonight comes from Kirsten Nielsen. Thanks, Hamish. In a recent press conference, Scott Morrison said that he believes in all the women of Australia. This is despite for months broadly dismissing and ignoring the allegations of sexual assault and harassment made by women from within the parliament. Scott Morrison went on to concede in an interview yesterday that blokes don't always get it right all the time and now finds himself at the centre of a political storm. My question to the panel is whether we are to believe that Scott Morrison is genuinely committed to this issue or are these the words of a politician scrambling to find his way out of a messy predicament largely of his own making? Sam Austin. Well, thank you, Kirsten. Um, it's the question of our time, isn't it? And... Um, I notice you're here with a young woman as well, um, slightly younger than my daughter, and these questions have been plaguing all of us, uh, not just this week, but in the months and years that we've been experiencing just a general lack of equality and then a whole lot of really nasty things that have been happening in the place that's meant to set the tone for the country in Parliament House. So um, it disturbs me to hear a Prime Minister saying that it's taken all of this into these last few days to suddenly work these things out. But what it does tell me is that it's only environments where you have lots of women in power and alongside men that get to observe these things at close range to actually see what's going on. And in my experience over 30 years in many big organisations, a lot of men start by saying that it's taken a long time to work that out because they've been up there by themselves with other groups of men and any homogenous group can't work out what's happening around it because they don't have the eyes or the antenna to tell you what's been going wrong. So I'm hoping that it's got so bad that the Prime Minister does really care. There are many things he could be doing right now, his government could be doing right now, that would tell us that he cares. He could accept Kate Jenkins' 55 recommendations to make all of our workplaces safer. He could be shuffling his cabinet to make sure there are lots of women that are in very senior positions. Do, do you be... believe him, though, that he gets it? Um, I think he's got it politically. I think, you know, this has been a week where everything has come together, whether it's been... But that, that's a... a different thing. Does he fundamentally get this issue? I think he gets it now. I think, I think he gets how horrific... I think what was the most disturbing thing for the Prime Minister were those gross acts by young men inside Parliament House that said they completely disrespected women who chose to be MPs. At that point, I think the Prime Minister really did get it because it was such an affront. But for women, I'm sure the women in the audience and watching tonight, we're so used to these kind of behaviours that we've been getting it for a very, very long time. And we're looking for men and women in leadership that actually say to us, enough's enough, as all of the rally rallies did around the country. Men and women called for this change and enough is enough. But they also said that we've got to start respecting women. There's a fundamental primary reason why these things happen and it's a lack of respect for us. It's our failure to have been allowed through the corridors of power and to be in equal numbers, running things, leading things. Um, and we've been kept at bay. And that's why I think it came as such a surprise because I don't think the Prime Minister's had experience really of a, of a community and a, a parliament that has women in equal numbers. Adam Crichton, how did you see those rallies? Uh, well, look, the March for Justice, I thought... I was actually in Melbourne uh, last week for it, actually, and I walked past it, and I must say there were so many placards which were really anti-Scott Morrison rather than, you know, pro-woman. I thought it was a very uh, political march. And, and the other thought that came to mind is what is the tangible aim of those people who are marching? I mean, if you go back 120 years, obviously women wanted the vote, and certainly, you know, they should have got it. Uh, many decades later, there was abortion. But 
what is justice this time? It's like, you know, it's like marching for happiness. I mean, it's, you know, of course everyone wants it, but what is the tangible outcome? It was pretty clear, wasn't it? I mean, we, yes, but what we could the federal government do about attitudes? It's the Commonwealth government. You know, it, it's, it can't legislate for people to be nice, right? It just can't. It, it, well, and no matter what the Prime Minister says, no matter what platitudes he utters, <laughs> It's not going to change people's attitudes. I that's that's up to civil society. That, that's what great leadership is all about. Tone from the top. The prime minister of the country mm. going Most out. People and don't pay any attention. Do you know what would have made all any the difference? Any attention to what you, the prime minister says? No, they do. No, they absolutely. Only people, the political class does. People, people here do. But people, people have been don't. paying attention to the prime minister's behaviour, which has been keeping women down for the last couple of years. I think those people have got very comfortable with the kind of things that have been happening to women and suddenly we all had enough. That's why the marches took place. But the thing the Prime Minister could have done... When you done... say we, though, I mean, it's only 100,000 or so women who marched. It's not oh, all women who marched. I, feel and I think I feel it's bad to, that to, to tarnish it, all men with, you know, with the same brush. But we brush. don't tarnish all men with that, the same brush. That's not what's going on That's the implication. Here. You know, women, men are half the population. Women are half the population. There we're more than bad half people we're, we're, in both groups. And so we're more both than half the population. And we have been held at bay. We have been... We are murdering a woman once a week in this country and have been doing that for many, many years. What would it take to get a community and the top of our parliament to say we get that we've got to change the behaviour, both of our parliaments, of our leaders, to actually listen to women? All, all women wanted in that rally, and the men, was to be listened to. <laughs> and then... And, and you know what? I'm, I'm actually certain that if the Prime Minister and his Cabinet had gone out onto the forecourt of Parliament House, I don't think they would have been booed. Hmm. No one else from the Parliament that went out was booed. I think they would have actually hmm. been asked to listen to all those speakers and then to listen to Brittany Higgins explain hmm. what it's like to be a survivor of an alleged yeah, rape metres away from the Prime Minister's office. Just, I mean, that, that, yeah, just to be clear, to that, I'm obviously not condoning any of the things that went on. They are shocking and they are awful and they should be prosecuted and sacked and kind of depending on the allegation. But we just have to keep things in proportion. But did you get the sense, though, That's all I'm that suggesting. this was the moment when every, almost every woman in the country felt every part of those things that have been going on had happened to them in some part of their life. And suddenly... Almost everyone in the country? How do you know that? I mean, that's just a... Stan Grant... Should we do it? Should we do how it? Did, <laughs> Stan Grant, how did you observe what's going on in Canberra right now? There, there are a couple of things, and I, I think Adam has a point to this extent, that protests do not always indicate mood and do not always presage political change. Remember the, the Vietnam moratoriums, the biggest protests... Australia's probably ever seen. Quarter of a million people out constantly. The Holt government at the time was returned with an increased majority. We saw 200,000 people walk across the bridge for reconciliation. John Howard would not say sorry. John Howard was returned to office time and time again. I don't know that political movements necessarily translate to that political change or that mood. The point, uh, another point I would make, though, and I think this is something that has been very apparent to me, is that as necessary and as urgent and as righteous as these claims are and this movement is, there have been so many women's voices who have not been listened to for a long time. When, and, and, and I just want to say, when it becomes a white middle-class issue, when it is in private schools, when it is in Parliament House, when it is in the press gallery, we take notice. But when Aboriginal women who have been suffering domestic violence at rates 40 times higher than the rest of the population, 10 times more likely to die as a result of that violence. When I have seen Aboriginal women marching and protesting and calling for support for generations, I did not see the same women outside Parliament House. <laughs> when, when poor women, when poor women, when migrant women, when refugee women have suffered these things, I did not see the same media attention. Poor women don't get interviewed on television programs. They're not on Q&A. There are a lot of voices that are not listened to here. And I think while this is a movement and a moment, we need to also reflect on our own blindness and our biases, that we can walk past the suffering of others for such a long time until it lands in your own backyard. I think you're, you're absolutely right to make that point. It was a point made last week on the consent uh, panel you had here by, um, by Joe Williams, who pointed out where does consent and where did the breach of consent start, and it was at the very beginning of the colonies, and he made a very powerful point, as you have too, Stan. It's not to say, though, that if those mistakes have been made and that those women have not been listened to in the past, that this isn't the moment when we all unite oh, and where we have to listen. And I think many of those women, migrant women, women um, who have, are on temporary visas, women who, are, um, who, are who have been decimated by the lack of respect for their allegations, whether it's sexual harassment or sexual assault or worse, 
they came together. And whenever I go to large groups of women now, with a lot of the women you've described, a lot of Indigenous women, a lot of uh, recently arrived migrants, and we talk about the anger that is sitting in the pits of our mm. stomachs, the anger, the fury and the sadness, I think we're drawing on a number of those women's but experiences. But what a but shame it is, Sam, that a nation reveals what it, what it is by what it cares about. And what a shame it is that it has to happen in white middle-class society for, for people to suddenly say there is a massive problem here. And it's been happening, as you well know, in factory floors, Absolutely. in homes, um, for, uh, for Aboriginal women. And, you know, as, as Joe pointed out last week, when a nation is built on theft, invasion, massacre and rape, you then wonder now why you have a culture and a society that reflects some of these attitudes. So, it, of course it's important, Sam, and of course this is a moment, but there have been so many voices not heard and not listened to and still, sadly, not on this panel tonight, Hamish. Right. I want to introduce someone else to this conversation, our special guest, the renowned French economist Thomas Piketty, who's live in Paris tonight. Would you please make him feel welcome? And before we put your questions to Thomas, we ask the ABC's analyst, Casey Briggs, to step us through the growing wealth divide here in Australia. We're in one of the wealthiest countries on earth. Decades of riches have rained down upon us. For some, though, it's been a torrent, while others have barely felt a sprinkle. In 2003, the least well-off 20% of Australian households shared in just 1% of the nation's wealth. The wealthiest 20%, they had around 59%. And in the years since to 2017, our economy grew and we collectively made it rain. The spoils just didn't fall evenly across the country. In 2017 dollars, there were 2,000 extra bucks per house in these households, and $1.3 million for these ones. In those years, these houses grew their average wealth by 6%, and these by 68%. And that was all before a massive economy-changing event in 2020. You may have heard of it. If you work in an occupation that tends to pay less, it's far more likely you were one of the many newly jobless last year. Before the pandemic, hospitality staff made up about 2.5% of all Australian workers. But the industry shrank more than half and made up about one-fifth of all the layoffs from February to May. Most of them waiters, bartenders, baristas. Retail workers saw their industry shrink by 13%. And those, by the way, are both occupations dominated by women. Workers on higher incomes didn't take much of a hit at all. As for the bigwigs, the number of people in managerial jobs, they dropped by just over 2%. Professionals saw an immediate contraction of around 1.7%, but recovered fast. There are now more white collar workers than before the pandemic began. All right, so on that note, our first question for Thomas comes from Jacob Andrewatha. Thomas Piketty, um, your work has been insightful in revealing the inequalities of capitalism today, yet globally we've had the massive protests for climate action in the US against police killings of African Americans, in your own country, the Yellow Vest movement, and in India, farmers rising up. These protest movements indicate a distrust with our political system and anger with the inequalities around us. You rightfully propose a progressive global tax as a solution to, this, to these inequalities, but isn't it utopian to expect that politicians and the rich would agree to having a significant proportion of their wealth taken away with the, from them without struggle? Thomas Piketty. Yeah, well, you know, they don't need to agree. Uh, you know, if you look at history, uh, you know, the movement toward more equality has always been a fight. And I think, you know, this fight uh, has to continue, uh, you know, regarding many dimensions of inequality. Uh, inequality of income is very large. Inequality of wealth is incredibly large. You know, in a country like Australia or France, for that matter, you know, the bottom 50% of the population owns, you know, about 5% of total wealth and the top 10% owns uh, around 60% of total wealth. So the amount, you know, the level of concentration of wealth uh, is enormous. We have uh, enormous uh, gender inequality, racial inequality. You know, in my country, in France, you know, people pretend that racial discrimination uh, sometimes is more an issue for the US and for France. But in fact, 
you know, the colonial legacies, the, the colonial past is, is also very important to, to understand today's inequality. So coming back to your question, you know, it's, the movement toward equality has always been a fight. So, you know, when, when you have uh, the New Deal uh, in the United States in the 1930s uh, that put in place under Roosevelt uh, progressive taxation with a top tax rate uh, up to 90% or even 91% on the very top incomes, and this is going to continue for several decades, uh, you know, this was not uh, done uh, with the authorization and approval of very uh, rich uh, uh, billionaire and taxpayer of the U.S. at the time. You know, there was a political majority to impose it. Uh, there was an enormous uh, legal battle, you know, the Supreme Court, uh, uh, you know, uh, battled against Roosevelt. But in the end, uh, you know, the political majorities uh, uh, managed to to, in that example, to reduce uh, inequality quite substantially and to pay for public infrastructure, public investment, social security system, which by and large, uh, you know, were a, a big success. To uh, Thomas, I, on that note, I, I just want to bring you know, in Gigi Foster. The, the, the question I asked is this idea of a progressive global tax system to solve these inequalities utopian? So, I mean, my question to Thomas is really, do you think that this is the moment that we can now take action in the same way that was done at the time of FDR, for example, and around the world, everybody just sort of has a light bulb go on and says, oh, yeah, whoops, we need to tax wealth globally. We need to do this measure, that measure. You know, here are the things that will fix this problem. My concern is that not that we are not recognizing the inequality problem. I think we do recognize the great wealth inequality particularly, but the global idea that we're sort of going to all collaborate and have a, a happy uh, you know, new world in which we're all taxing wealth and we're all collaborating, some country is going to be the odd man out. And, is going, and that's where all the rich people are going to flee. And they're going to put their money there and they're, not, they're going to evade the taxes. Bruce, what do you make of this sort of proposal? A new system replacing when, what we've got? I think we... Um, you know, I, I think... We need I, to. In some cases, you know, we need to, in, to Let's change just hear from Bruce the as a, as a international to legal first. system. I, I don't think these things can be um, solved politically uh, without the will of the people. And the will of the people is um, a moral decision we all have to make. And until we make a moral decision, like any decent eight year old would make, and say that inequality is unfair, then we're not going to go there. You know, as Gigi said, if um, you start taxing people, they'll go to a tax haven. You know, it's disgusting to have a tax haven, and yet we accept it. So we have to change our moral outlook uh, on how the world works. And it means that we have to go to uh, the places where our entrepreneurs and politicians come from and in this country it's private schools, and we, we have to talk to those kids about fairness. And it's not about whatever it takes. It's not about winning the game. It's about being a good person, being a good citizen. And I don't think that's happening in our world at the moment on many levels, be it economy, race, women. It's just not happening. So, Thomas, the point that's being made is that we're just not willing to make the moral choice for what you propose. Yeah, no, you're right. I think, you know, teaching uh, is, is very important. Teaching better values is very important. But we also need to change the rules of the game. So, you know, the problem is that we've created a system where we've created a sort of uh, sacralized right, you know, to make a fortune by using the public infrastructure of your country, by using the education system of your country and then you can push on a button and you know transfer your wealth somewhere else and nobody is able to follow you and to make you pay the tax that you should pay but you know this system has been man made you know it has been created by a very sophisticated uh, uh, international treaties and and then you know 20 years 30 years later we come and say Oh, too bad, you know, we don't know uh, where the rich are, we can't tax them, so we're going to have to tax you, you know, the immobile people, the middle class, the lower middle class. But of course, you know, th these people are very uh, unhappy with this statement. So what we need to do is to change, 
in particular the international treaties on, on free capital flows with, without any uh, taxation, regulation, coordination. And it's up to each country you know, to put conditions. Uh, you know, we've started to see OECD discussion about uh, automatic transmission of information, about who owns what, where, but this is still you know, very much an informal discussion. You know, we need uh, each country to put condition and, and to say, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't want, you know, that kind of system which in effect implies that the tax burden is always going to fall back uh, on the middle class and lower middle class and, and which make people uh, hate uh, globalization the, the, way, the way it is. So it's really up to you to change this international agreement. We don't need to wait for every country in the world to agree. It, it's up to Australia. I, 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 I think a lot of our politicians will like that thing. I want to take our next questioner uh, tonight, uh, uh, Maria Baranova. Um, thank you. Uh, Bill Shorten in Australia uh, proposed uh, changes to franking credit policy. Um, Jeremy Corbyn in Britain campaigned for giving 10% of ownership of big companies to workers. We tried to address inequality, but we suffered catastrophic losses, even in the Labour strongholds. What gone wrong with their political message? So this is something that Thomas writes about in his latest book. But Stan, I want you to mm. answer that first. What's happened to the political left? Why can't they win? A couple of things. One is that the political left, and this has been a project now of the past 40 years or so, and Tomas talks about this in both of his books, has become much more captive of um, cosmopolitan, um, metropolitan issues that don't necessarily address their previous working class constituency. Um, the, there's been a really interesting thing happen in politics in the United States and in Australia, that the educated classes, the university classes, have moved more to the left, the Democrats and Labor, and the working classes have moved more to the right. John Howard talked about Howard's battlers. Remember Donald Trump with that appalling phrase, I love the poorly educated. Well, of course he did, because these were the people that he could say they have abandoned you, they have deserted you. And remember, there, was some, there is some merit to this. In 2007, 2008, Barack Obama becomes president on that slogan of yes, we can and hope. And he stood there and protected the bankers. He stood between the pitchforks and the bankers. No banker went to jail. No banker lost their home or their jobs. Within a year, the, the, uh, the, the, the bankers' bonuses were back. But people lost their homes. People lost their jobs. And then what did Barack Obama say to these people? Well, they always cling to their God and their guns. And then Hillary Clinton dismisses them as deplorables. You know, as William Blake once said, the poet, a dog starved at his master's gate will predict the ruin of the state. And inequality is ruining the state, deforming our politics. And the left has a lot to answer for in this. Thomas, that's, I suppose, an end point. <laughs> you write about how we got there. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I think uh, the, the, the centre-left and the centre-right, you know, have made big mistakes, you know, in the way we've been uh, organizing globalization in the past decades. But, you know, my, my problem is not to blame, you know, different people, it's to see how today we can change this organization of globalization. And, you know, I think the bottom line is that you cannot have a free trade, free capital flows uh, with other countries if you don't have, at the same time, a minimum level of common taxation for the most powerful economic actors, uh, some common uh, environmental policy with, uh, you know, with, uh, with targets in terms of carbon emissions, uh, which can be monitored and which can be sanctioned if they are not uh, properly followed, and more generally with, with uh, you know, a social agenda to make uh, globalization work in terms of distribution of income and wealth. So, you know, I'm not against the circulation of goods and services and investment, but this has to come in, in international agreements together with, with uh, you know, a minimum level of common taxation and, and social policy. And, you know, this can be done. This is really up to you, up to us. Uh, Hamish, can I ask Thomas a question? 
it. Just we may not have time for it, but <laughs> go, you, can, you can go no, for it. I ask, um, you would know uh, Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, who recently gave the Reef Lectures in January, where he talked about the sweep of history from Glasgow to Glasgow, from Adam Smith and the moral sentiments of cap capitalism to the COP negotiations in November in Glasgow. And he makes the point that across um, capital, as it was defined by Smith, which had to have a moral sentiment at its mm. core, that we have lost the moral sentiments. And he tracks that through the credit crisis, the COVID crisis, and then the climate crisis. And I guess he posits something I think we all learnt through COVID, which was in COVID, we all started to put very different things forward, almost globally, but certainly nationally, around the position of care and care at the centre versus economics. And then climate is going to teach us about a form of tax on carbon. And I think these things move between left and right, Stan. They're not defined by the left and right. These are the global issues that determine whether we will be a, a, a sustainable world. And then you add to that the issues of our young people and our women. And you write in your book that the patriarchy during the latter part of the um, 20th century set in train what I think we're now seeing with our protest movements with women, which was keeping women out of the upper echelons of earning. And so, Stan, the, the women who weren't earning, mm. they were there because of the patriarchy and a very misogynistic history. And those women are rising up too. Are they're concerned? not left or right. They're, 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 these are the macro issues about a sustainable are world. Are you concerned, Thomas, that part of the problem with the modern left is that it's so focused on things like identity politics that some of these old-fashioned, if you like, uh, kind of core economic issues about inheritance tax and wealth taxes have been forgotten. And you actually see very few parties on the left around the world even, even dare to propose them because they would much rather talk about, you know, uh, LGBTI issues, for instance. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think you have more and more left people across the world uh, and also people from the right, you know, who, who approve that, you know, we need more redistribution of, of income and wealth. You know, for instance, you know, in the United States, if you look at opinion polls, you know, there's a vast majority of public opinion today, not only among Democrats, but also among Republicans, that there should be a wealth tax. And, you know, the wealth tax proposal that was made by Sanders and Warren uh, during the, the Democratic Party primary last year, you know, both, of, both together they, they, they got almost half of the vote and more than half of the vote among the, the younger voters. And, and if you look at opinion polls today, you know, a majority of US public opinion support this. Uh, you know, the Green Party in Germany last week uh, made this new platform public. This includes the reintroduction of a wealth tax. Uh, in, in Germany, uh, you know, I, I think these issues are changing. I, you know, I can tell you, uh, you know, when I published Capital in the 21st century back in 2014, uh, I had discussion with Elizabeth Warren in the US or, uh, or, or social democratic or green leaders in Germany. And at the time, you know, the, the consensus for the wealth tax was much less clear than what it is today. But so, Thomas, you know, Thomas, I think even things if we are have changing. A... Even if we yep. have a consensus of opinion, right, if people feel, oh, yes, this is something that I want to stand behind, I, I still want to come back to the fact that this notion that we're going to all come together as a globe and, and, and unite upon the moral sentiment, you know, of uh, we must well, tax we can't the do that wealthy. With climate change. We, right. climate there's change no way. Climate example, change has been example, stalling for failure. decades because we can't do it. So what we, we need to focus on, I think, as individual sovereign nations is what can we do in our sovereign borders now, mm. and how can we sort of trap the wealthy into being taxed? And, and that's where the proposal, which I'm sure you've seen in many different countries, to tax unimproved land comes from. Because if you buy a land piece here in Australia, let's say you bought it in 1980 for $200,000, and today it's $4 million, you just get that, that raise, that huge, Im massive amount of wealth, just as a windfall gain, because of the efforts of Australia to develop that area where your house is. And that's not mm. fair. And, and that kind of policy is feasible for us. What's not feasible is to somehow imagine that 200 and some odd nations around the world are all going to come together and agree. Another thing that's a problem, of course, is corporate taxation. We can't, we can't tax Apple, Google, uh, you know, these, these places do huge amounts of activity in our countries, and yet they don't pay any tax, basically. <laughs> How do we get around that? We can send them a bill. We can send them a bill. Australia can say, you are not going to trade here unless you pay this estimated amount of tax on your estimated activities here. And we have to stand courageously and say that to these, these companies, because we otherwise won't get them up. So on that note, we're going to have to say goodbye to Thomas Piketty, because we're going to lose the connection with France. We're so grateful to you for joining us tonight. Would you please thank Thomas Piketty? <laughs> so...
Just on the point you were making about land and property and values and people trying to work their way up, I want to introduce us to Tapan, who's here. Uh, you're a relatively new migrant to Australia. You've been here 10 years or so. Yes. Uh, you're a citizen. Uh, almost. And your wife is a citizen, though. Yes. You both work full time. Yes. And what are you saving for? What are you trying to buy? Um, I'm buying, uh, I, I will, I'll, we would like to buy a house around $650,000. We've been trying for almost five years, but last two years very hard. How hard is it? Um, last year we had $100,000 in our bank accounts when the house prices were 600. Now we have 200,000, the house prices are around 650 to 700, where there is no public transport. Mm. Um, congested traffic, just the single lane roads, Mm, no child cares, and we both work in a city. So my basic question, very simple question is, why in Australia, if you want to buy a home, house, why it has to get expensive, and uh, why has to get very, very far to get a home. Uh, you know? bef before I put it to the panel, I asked you earlier, you know, about the political parties. Do you feel that any of them are, are helping you here or willing to help you on this? Not really, but they certainly try to getting harder for lower income earners sure. and it's making harder for younger, um, like the couples to grow their family. And myself, like we want to have a a second baby, but our future is so uncertain. At the same time, our population growth is growing down. So thank you very much for the both political parties to <laughs> okay. helping us. OK, so this kind of goes to the point that we're talking about here, political parties, failure to meet expectations. Bruce, do you see why young people are so disappointed in politics when they can't do something pretty simple and reasonable in terms of expectations, like buy a home? Well, I think uh, re uh, reverse gearing uh, came up as a political issue at the last election and got wiped off the table. Um, and I, I think this is uh, goes back to what I said earlier. I think we as a people uh, have to decide uh, that that's not good enough, uh, that the accumulation of wealth by a few uh, has to impact on the majority and... Um, it's, it's not, not fair and it's not going to get us very far. The real um, it, It'll get us, you know, in the short term um, to some hedonistic ideal of um, human life, but it's not sustainable. There are certainly... Oh, and it's not, not moral, it's not justifiable, and we as a people have to have different values. And I, I think Just it's on a, the issue of negative gearing. a value about our, our society uh, that is clearly wrong. Well, just on the issue of negative gearing, look, we have had it in Australia for as long as we've had income tax and we've had very low house prices, very high house prices. So that's not the real reason why house prices are so expensive. Well, the reason is the central banks around the world have been cutting interest rates mm -hmm. now for decades. And, and the logical consequence of that is that asset prices go up hugely, you know, whether they're bond prices, whether they're house prices, anything. And so you've seen this extraordinary transfer of wealth, really, from our generation, if you like, to the boomer generation and to their parents. And it makes it so hard. There's, sorry, sorry, there's something else going on here, Adam, which I think goes to Gigi's point about how do we as nations become bold and ambitious for our people. The Centre for Policy Development did a study of Australians engagement with our democracy, and Australians said three times more than anything else they care about is using our democracy to make us more equal. So as, as citizens, we want this to be an equal country. Do they, but our do they say? No, they do. But our, poli our, our old fashioned politic, which you talked about as left and right, it's a shouty, fighty, win the election. And we have made property values and property ownership the, yes, the but domain. It's not the government. The That's domain. My point. The it's domain. The the government. Well, I think, I think it's also politics. It's, it's Bruce's point. We're not listening to a populace that says, actually, there's a whole lot of compromises we are prepared to make because we want to, we want to live well, we want to raise our children well, we want to deal with climate change because we don't want to have our, f our kids' futures but, compromised. But we don't, we don't vote that way, Sam. No, no, because the politics we don't, we of the time. We don't vote that way. No, it's not the politics of the time. Last time, you know, we saw that Bill, that Bill Shorten went to an election with an expansive he lost agenda. One, it was a one an expansive seat, agenda. By, by, by one seat yeah, lost, he, right? Yes, so this, yes. the, the, the population wasn't split so far that it accepted. No. The, the message was not sold well. But there is a winner. So we don't we don't have a political narrative anymore but there, that but, says to this population, says to, to, to says to you, mm. this is what we want you to vote for. We go back to the political ideologies and we fight at the ballot mm. box instead of saying land tax is the best way to deal with wealth inequality, which you alluded to. Absolutely the best way. But both so sides bold, of politics. So, so boldness. Both sides of politics very Australia, scared of it because Australia, of politics. Australia, 
Australians, people don't want a land you know, tax. Australians are prepared to live thing. with inequality. The idea of the egalitarian Australia has always been a myth. Aboriginal people have never been included in that idea of an egalitarian Australia. You know, over the over the past few years, Australia actually, when you look at Thomas Piketty and his his equation for the way that inequality becomes really endemic in a society, Australia had largely ev ev evaded a lot of that. But in the last few years, we have seen rapid increase in inequality. The top 20% in Australia holds wealth at 90 times the level of the bottom 20% mm -hmm. in Australia. And we're prepared to live with that. Aboriginal that people... That is true, Stan, but just, just on that point, and it, it's certainly a problem, but it's also worth pointing out that it's only the top 20% of households that actually pay any tax. Yeah, in yeah. Terms. No, well, no no, uh, exactly. Tax. And, if, <laughs> so. and if, if you go to an election promising you taxes, the odds are you will lose. Bill Shorten showed that. John Hewson showed that point, you know. It is rare that you, you can go to an election um, promising a new tax and win. John Howard proved you could do that. It is difficult to do that. We are prepared to live in Australia with Aboriginal people dying 10 years younger than the rest of the population. Of course we're prepared to live with it because that's still what happens in 2021, that Aboriginal children under the age of 15 are five times more likely to commit suicide and we are prepared to live with that. We've, we don't vote and change our vote because Aboriginal people suffer or poor people suffer. We vote with, for our interests over and over again. <laughs> right, let's take our next question. It comes from Louise Ilhain for Gigi Foster and Adam Crichton on the positions they took on COVID and lockdowns. Um, I just wanted to ask them how they could live with themselves after the comments they made last year during the COVID-19 pandemic about how when people get to 60, their life is pretty much done. I want to know how they live with themselves. And considering that I've just turned 60 and I've got an illness that I'm not going to get better from, and I wanted to know, do they want me to be got rid of? And I hope that they go through, as they travel through life, they never have to be thought of as the other. And I want to know how they propose that we give sick and disabled people a better life, a good life. Uh, Louise, when you heard and read what Gigi and Adam had to say about COVID, how did you respond? How did you feel? Well, you know, I watched that Q&A when um, Gigi Foster was on the, the first time I clapped eyes her and I just burst into tears. It was awful. I was so upset and I wrote very many angry emails to the ABC. <laughs> And um, then I've seen Adam a couple of times last year on the drum saying similar stuff about the fact that, and on Twitter, saying that his dad was 65 and he, he, he'd, be, he'd be okay to be done, you know. It's disgraceful. It was just disgraceful. Like, people aren't worth anything. And you know what? We're not a commodity, people. We're not. Okay, well, thanks, Louise. I think you need the right well, to reply to that, well, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> well, firstly, just, just on that, that last point about 65 and saying about my dad, I never said that. That was actually someone else. So I think it's very important to check facts when you're making sure. those sorts of, <laughs> dad wouldn't sorts be of points. Dad wouldn't be happy. But, look, I mean, we never said, I'm sure Gigi and I have never said that, you know, once you hit 60, you know, that's it, you're not worth it. That's, that's obviously a shocking claim and neither of us would ever make that. You know, all, all we've been arguing, really, was for what was the consensus view of science at the end of 2019, which is you take a rational approach to a pandemic, you don't shut everything down, you don't force people to do things, you don't drag people screaming from cars at the border, you don't shut the borders, you know, you, you don't close hospitals to all other patients for months on end, you know, you don't end travel. I mean, all these things are so extreme, uh, suspensions of our liberty for very long periods of time, and I'm no extreme libertarian at all, but this is extraordinary what's happened in the past year, and so we've just been arguing Let's have a sense of proportion here, you know. I personally think the world has kind of lost its mind a bit over COVID. I mean, we are all going to die of something. We're all going to die. There are risks every day that we have to deal with, right? And we normally deal with them as a society. You know, three million people every year die of Adam, respiratory can I diseases. Ask something? Millions die of cigarettes around the world. We don't ban cigarettes. Can I just ask you something? At, in August last year, the UK had 500 infect deaths 
uh, uh, infections per day, and we had 500 infections per day. The UK said, let it rip, sent everyone back out. They never said that. They did. No, no, no. At, <laughs> in August 2020, that's exactly what happened. As, as Victoria closed down, as the numbers got to 650. And the period since August 2020 and now, Australia's economy has rebounded. The UK has gone into another lockdown well, We have over $650 Christmas. billion dollars no, no, more let, debt. Let, let me just explain. Point, yeah. Just let me finish. One thing. Tonight at the MCG, there's 75,000 people off watching the Pies and the Blues pay. That's um, 10,000 less people than have died in the no, UK. No, that's great. In the that's period a wonderful since, thing. No, 85,000 people more than Australia died in yes, the UK. Yes, but that's not because you, what we've done necessarily. No, no, it is because we, we don't know what it's, we... The we're counter, lucky. We're the very counter, fortunate. The counterfactual of us doing what we did is, was that where the others did not close down, people died in big numbers yeah. and the economies have not come back. Gigi, I'll leave this to Gigi. So this was a very interesting year because after my appearances on Q&A, I actually was apparently defamed on Twitter, according to my friends there. I'm not on Twitter. And, and as a social scientist who studies groups and societies and what makes us tick, this was an amazing opportunity for me to see people in action completely spellbound on a particular thing that can hurt people, which is COVID, and forgetting about everything else that matters in a normal time. And I was prepared to call that out, and I am proud that I did, because there were very few voices in Australia who were telling a sensible, sane story, despite the hysteria that was gripping the world. Now, I will never say that COVID is not a dangerous disease. Absolutely it is. And I certainly never said that after 60, somebody's life is not worth living. I would never say that. My arguments have always been from the beginning to the end, we need to do what's best for human welfare as a whole. And human welfare is not determined solely by whether people are suffering and dying from COVID. It is also determined by how mentally healthy they are, which they're not when they're shut up inside, unable to see their family and their friends, how well the economy is doing, because that predicts how much the government can spend on things like hospitals and schools and infrastructure. It, it has to do with suicidal ideation of our young people who have been locked out of schools and locked out of jobs. It has to do with people who go bankrupt and then have more health problems. And it has to do with all the crowded out health care that didn't happen because we were so pathologically focused on COVID. So my story of the world of what's happened this year is that the world went mad. Mm. I continued to say something sensible and I will be proud to have served Australia in that way. Okay. When you look at the something pretty straightforward like the number of people that have died in the UK and the US and parts of Europe. You're talking about total deaths overall, not just from COVID. Total. Because I'm prepared to talk about total deaths. But I just want to ask about the COVID deaths. I mean, do you... Why? Do you, Why? 60 million people because die Because it's every what year we've been world. talking about for a year. You know how many people die every year in, in Australia million, from something else? I mean, every day we lose 300 to 400 people. In total from COVID, we've lost fewer than 1,000. And for that... We've, we've gone uh, hundreds of billion models. dollars into models. debt. We yes. have now, uh, you know, amazing, you know, crazy numbers on GDP. We've gone backwards something like 2.6% last year when normally we go mm -hmm. forward by 4 to 5%. That brings us further back on the trajectory mm -hmm. of growth. And GDP is not a perfect number, mm -hmm. but it's something. We can, we can, you know, compare across time. And the real costs are all going to emerge time. in the future. You know, they're and not immediate. We've, we've jeopardized our future. The Bruce future. Pascoe. Um, traje trajectories of growth... Um, ever increasing growth. Mm. Um, can the world sustain that? Mm. Are we always going to assume that our wealth will get greater, uh, production will get greater? Uh, what about the poor old earth? Uh, she can't sustain this and yet we assume uh, that with our ever increasing industrialisation um, and our ever increasing population, which no one wants to talk about, uh, that we could just keep on going at this um, escalating rate. So and, and we can't. And uh, we, we have to address it. And, you know, I've, the, this country has a... We talked about Australian history for Australian political history. Well, Australian political history is 120,000 years old minimum. Um, and that was a society uh, <laughs> basically egalitarian. Um, we have probably got the oldest village on earth in this country, which meant we invented society. And that society for 120,000 years was largely egalitarian. I think this is a triumph. And I think we need to refer to it more and more frequently and, and stop looking at the, 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 the cycle of news as if this is the world. It is not the world. The world is in our hearts. And it's what we...
It's, it's what we believe and what we do uh, which are the main things, not about looking at um, perceptions of a deed, but it's actually what we do, what we the people do to each other and for each other uh, that matters. Stan? Um, you know, the, the French philosopher Bernard-Henri Lévy actually wrote a book talking about madness, the virus in the age of madness. He made this point. I think, I think we can focus on COVID in isolation, but he made this point. A pandemic is a social phenomenon with a medical aspect. And I think this is what we've seen, both in, in the approach to this, in, in locking down and shutting down at the expense of economies. Um, we've also seen uh, reveal both our strengths and our vulnerabilities. The strengths we thought we had, our interconnectedness, our global economy, the ability to hop on a plane here and in 10 hours be somewhere else on the other side of the world, also revealed our fragility, that we share this place in such close proximity. There was also something else that, that did concern me, and it goes to the point that, that um, Adam and Gigi have made. And, and while I accept the desire, the need to, to lock down to preserve health and the outcome of Australia, I think, augurs well for the choices that we made. And we were a rich country. We were able to, to afford that broadly, even though we're now in debt and we're going to have to be paying that off. What did concern me, and I think we need to think long and hard about this, is that in an emergency, when we do surrender freedom, it takes a long time, if ever, to get it back. You know, look at 9-11 after the attacks on the World Trade Centre. We surrendered a lot of our freedom, the media freedom, the ability of government to be able to access our metadata, um, to shut down reporting of so certain events. And we don't get a lot of those things back. There is a reason that Albert Camus wrote The Plague as an allegory of totalitarianism. Because the virus of, of coronavirus or the plague may also carry a virus of tyranny. And at a time when democracy is in retreat and Freedom House shows us that, you know, that which measures the health of democracy, that we have had 15 straight years of declining democracy, when authoritarianism in the shape of China in particular <laughs> is on the rise and, 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 uh, and resurgent around the world, these things of freedom, these things that bind us to each other, these things that we are meant to hold dear, sacrificed and surrendered, are hard to get but back. And while I accept... Stan, isn't the paradox here, though, that by locking down and by mm. taking away freedoms so aggressively in Australia, we now enjoy freedoms that much of the rest of the world doesn't have? And, and, uh, and, we, and I accept what you say to, only to a certain extent because during that period... We learnt a lot about ourselves. To Bruce's point, we all slowed mm. down. I accept the, the mental health issues that we have to pay for now. I accept that we actually had to change as a society. But you talked about an economy stopping. I think a lot of people through this period rethought what it meant to be part of the Australian society. And, and let me finish for a sec. Because they actually started to talk about neighbourhood again and what, what mattered to us in our relationships with our families, what, how to put care at the centre of an economy instead of growth or the, the kinds of things that we had got so obsessed with. And people well, seem to enjoy... those are probably the people on, you know, on fixed salaries, good salaries... The privileged no, people. The privileged people. people. No, no, I'm talking about people who also got... No, we also got um, Lots of people who lost no, their jobs. No, they got JobKeeper as well and, and remained attached because of a, gov a huge amount of government... But imagine but if we had nothing. taken the $100 billion we spent on JobKeeper and instead put it into Aboriginal health... Mm. Well, and, we and might and be I, able to erase look, some of those differences. I, I, and I instead, accept, we're just trading water. I accept everything Sam says. We did reflect on these things. We were nicer and kinder to each other. But what are we hearing now more than ever? When do we get back to normal? Mm. When do we get back to the footy again? When do we get back to the well, pub again? Saying that. When, when, oh, yes, they are, Sam. There's 75,000 people at a football game tonight. We are going to go straight back <laughs> to business as usual. We are in a rush to get back to business as usual. So while I appreciate that sentiment, as I said before, you measure a country by what it cares about. And Australia has indicated time and time again that it does not care about the most vulnerable in society and we're prepared to walk past the most vulnerable in society. So, yes, those, that lockdown, which I accepted at the time as necessary to get through that crisis, Hamish, I, I, I think we can, we can say, yes, we can enjoy greater freedoms now. But there is a bigger question here mm. and there is, a real, um, there is a real contest in our world between democracy and freedom and authoritarianism. And while Australia may be, as an island, able to sit aside from that, um, eventually those things catch up with us. And we see that with the China relationship and caught in the crosshairs of the US and China tensions right now. So let's not forget the lessons that we learned, Sam. 
Let's not rush to get back to normal. Agreed. Let's do it, as Bruce says, think about things beyond perpetual growth. Let's think about inequality. Let's challenge our liberalism and democracy to be better. But let's also cherish what is at the foundation of that, which is our freedom. And once you start tearing apart those things, then the entire edifice starts to collapse. OK, let's take our next question. It comes from Zach Eggleston. I'm the first Australian born out of my completely Kiwi family. I have Māori ancestors and want to know what, why Australia seems unable to learn from our friends across the ditch when it comes to how we interact with our Indigenous population. New Zealand has a treaty, a far greater representation in Parliament, road signs around the country and Te Reo Māori, and for the first time, a Māori foreign minister. My question is, what steps can Australia take to be more like New Zealand and to increase our Indigenous understanding and appreciation? Bruce Pascoe. Well, we're always uh, envious of the uh, treaty in New Zealand, even if that treaty uh, was a fraud uh, and rewritten uh, uh, after uh, the Maori people had signed it. Um, so it, it's very, very similar to what happened in American Australia, where every, every uh, agreement that had been made between First Nation American Indians, for instance, and the, uh, the government, every one of them uh, was knocked back by the Congress. And in Australia, we haven't had a treaty, so nothing has ever gone to the parliament and taken seriously the very mild uh, Uluru statement, statement from the heart, was rejected by lunchtime by Malcolm Turnbull, someone who we thought might have considered it. Um, Australia has got an enormous way to go before a treaty can be uh, cobbled together uh, and approved. Um, it is happening in Victoria, that uh, planning, that thought, that care, um, but we're yet to see how it will work. But, but, you know, I go back to what I said before, we have to go to the kids um, and we have to uh, talk with our kids and talk about fairness and decency, um, morality. Um, otherwise, every form that we have and uh, can be compromised. And Gigi was talking about um, trapping the, um, the, the rich into paying a tax. Well, you know, we need to do, we need, we need the rich to pay taxes, otherwise we're going to be poor. But uh, a, a scheme where you trap someone to do something uh, which they don't believe is going to fail because uh, last time we had a, the chance of a mining tax uh, Gina Reinhart put on a yellow hat and defied Australia, and we uh, Australia folded. Uh, I think the problem with so the treaty, though, it ha we have to change the the morality of the way we converse. And um, I don't want to sound like just very briefly, Pollyanna, just on the treaty issue, but not... I, I do want us to start thinking uh, uh, that these questions are moral questions. They're not. Political. I think we would all agree, everyone in this room, that uh, the Indigenous policy. Indigenous outcomes in Australia are really a stain on our nation, and you were alluding to some of them earlier. They're shocking, and you know, we should all be ashamed of them. But, but a treaty is a more extreme version of the very identity politics and race-based Aboriginal policy that we've been pursuing for decades, and the outcomes are shocking. But, Adam, uh, what, 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 greater race politics, what greater identity politics could there be than a group of people who come here and put a flag in the ground and dismiss 80, 100,000 yeah. years of culture and history oh, yeah. and claim that la land yeah. for Britain. I mean, what, what greater identity politics could but there be when, when, Bob Hawke, when Bob Hawke in 1984 promised a treaty and then was, received this avalanche of, of opposition from mining companies mm. and, and, and various governments around. What greater identity politics was there than that? If you talk about identity politics, who plays identity politics more powerfully than the right? What greater <laughs> identity politics is there than a white society that has built an, an extraordinary country, I give you that, but an extraordinary country for all of its wealth and all of its prosperity and all of its peace and cohesion still lives with the fact that the people who paid the greatest price for that yep. are not recognised mm. in our own country. That's identity and, politics. And, and, 
that, since that, since that is that, Bruce mentioned the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and I had the great privilege last night to spend an hour and a half with Auntie Pat Anderson and Professor Megan Davis, who were the women who were at the forefront of the, the dialogues that led to the Uluru Statement from the Heart and have carried so many of the women of the, the Indigenous community through that statement. And they reminded a group of 50 women as part of a yarning circle last night that our job as non-Indigenous people is to sit and listen and sit alongside First Nations Australians and listen and read the Uluru Statement from the Heart. It's now been translated into 60 languages so that everyone in the country could read this. It is the most beautiful document that invites us as Australians and citizens to actually push our government to let us go to a referendum to have a constitutional enshrinement of First Nations people. Not to be fooled by a voice to government, but a voice to the parliament. Do we really think, though, those cycles and it, was, of, and it was dispensed with it was dispensed on a Friday afternoon it was, with, with, with barely a whimper? And, Sam, I have was, to tell no, you again, was, I didn't see people protesting outside parliament the, house on of, that day they, either. They, they might have protested. A lot of Australians None were of deeply, deeply upset well, by well, that dismissal. But, deeply, and that, that's, but that's one thing. Deeply you. upset is not. Enough. That's why we need... We no one changes their niceties. vote for that Aboriginal people. Voices. You know, nobody... We, we cannot just say we are upset about this. This is a matter of justice. Can I, can I just this say is a matter a of saying that here. here are the first people of this nation and the first people of this nation should be recognised, there should be treaties, Agreed. there should be acknowledgement of sovereignty. Agreed. We should not have people living and dying in, 20, in 21st century Australia at the rate that Aboriginal mm. people are, Agreed. the most imprisoned people in but the country. But a treaty will not and change not any of those to, things but, but Adam, on the ground. But the alcoholism, Adam, but Adam, the drugs, the that's what we've got to get. But Adam, it's, it's is been it? shown in other parts of the world that where treaties are enacted and properly enforced and properly supported Supported, you can have positive outcomes. Can there I are talk, positive can I outcomes in Canada. There are positive outcomes yeah. in New Zealand. Can there are positive outcomes in the United States. It's it's not just a one size fits all. But we're not even at the starting blocks. Okay. Can I just say this? This exact all of the things you've been saying right now are just to me ringing exactly the the same bells that the whole you know female in, inequality and justice thing ring. Right. It's basically a failure of empathy. And, and I'm very much on Bruce's side here that, you know, we, we need to be educating our children that what is best for ourselves and other people is best for us mm. as a nation. And, and it's the us part that but, has but been Gigi, lost. It's Gigi, been lost I'm by sorry. the identity politics. Mm. It's been lost by the, by the divisive way in which we speak about our history. Mm. What we need is practical solutions mm. that cater to all of us because it is good for us as a country. But, but, it's good but Gigi, for us I, and our I, part. I, I, and it's good for is making economic I, outcomes problem. I appreciate well. that. And I appreciate that it, that it might be good for us. But an Aboriginal justice should not be predicated on what is good for you or good for white Australia, Agreed. it should be predicated on justice and what is right for but Aboriginal justice people. Justice is good for us. And, this is what I mean. A country that is just is If something is comes out of that that is good for the nation, well and good. But first, can we just do the just and right thing? A country as prosperous and powerful and rich as Australia. Can we just do that and worry about healing and what is good for other people afterwards? Just do the right thing. And it's not just social justice. You know, of course we should uh, be socially just. Uh, it's a non-brainer. But it's not about social justice. Have a look at this country. Have a look at the length of time that people were able to work together here and have a prosperous life over a longer period of time than any other people on earth and only interrupted uh, by the British how did they do that? Isn't this a question that the world is interested in? It's not just about um, Aboriginal uh, people getting justice. We're not a charity. Uh, this was a vibrant, successful society which was sustainable. Isn't the world interested in this? Isn't the world interested in how it was done? Because there was government here. This was government. And it was done over an enormous period of time. I think... This is a social jewel in, in the world and needs to be analysed. Aboriginal people uh, are not a charity. You know, we, we hold something here and it's in the art and the Burrup Peninsula uh, is being mined at the moment and deliberately um, damaged by people who were trying to put Aboriginal people in their place, ignoring that incredible art, that incredible culture. This is something we need to 
to look at as, as a country and a world. But surely, Bruce, the, you know, the arrival of Europeans, of course, at the time was shocking, but I mean, A, it was inevitable. Some, some nation was going to arrive here. It was the, the Spanish or the French, and it would have been a lot worse if it was the Spanish or the French in terms of treatment of the natives. Uh, but in the long term, uh, it's, you know, it's brought new technological progress and, and you know, advancements, which are of value. Well, you're going to have to advancements. Wrap this up. Advancements um, are not monetary. Advancements are moral. You know, if we. What about electricity? Electricity is quite. If useful. we're going somewhere as a human race, it's not to be richer; it is to be better. And, and I think just can I just make a, just make a final point too, Adam? That, that that binary, you know, British came here, it could have been worse, isn't it good what Western civilization has given us? It's a false binary. Aboriginal people are not saying, you know, I, I love philosophy, I love history, I love economics, I love to read, I love Shakespeare. You know, um, I, I, I was raised in the church. I'm still an Aboriginal person. This is not a binary. We're not saying we want to tear the place down. We are saying we want to be given our place in it. And what greater statement could there be about liberal democracy than for Aboriginal people in Victoria to say, we will negotiate in good faith with the state government for a treaty? Or for Aboriginal people to say, we want a place not outside the Constitution, mm -hmm. Adam, inside mm -hmm. the Constitution. Mm -hmm. We are no, just, just add to very brief, Mr. Stanton. Thank you. Uh, I want to also pay respect. Thank you, Brother uh, Kiora, for your asking your question. And, and again, to, to send our respects to all Aboriginal people, pay our respects to the traditional people of this land and all Aboriginal people and First Nations people around this country, wherever you may be watching the program. We will leave it there. Stan, thank you very much for your gracious close to the program. Please thank our wonderful panel, Bruce Pascoe, Gigi Foster, Adam Crichton, Sam Mostyn and Stan Grant. Thanks to those of you here in the studio and at home for joining us tonight and to those of you streaming us on iView as well. Well, we're back on Thursday, the 8th of April. We're leaving you tonight with the wonderful Dami Yim performing Lonely Cactus. Good night. <laughs> Again to dinner, gave you three weeks' notice as for your requirements. But you're counting down the minutes till your next appointment, stuck in awkward silence. Underneath what you do, there's nothing but blue and pieces that don't have a place. Everyone sees clear. They're scared to hurt your feelings Now let me tell it to your face You're a lonely cactus All on your own You're on the attack But you sit by the phone A lonely cactus In the desert sun But you're scared if you get too close You wonder why nobody tries anymore you bleed us dry, still want it all There's more to life than chasing you in circles Do you want to run it all? Underneath what you do There's nothing but blue And pieces that don't have a place I'm so tired of hearing Leave your name and number Now let me tell it to your face That you're alone the phone.